Doctrine and Covenants 131 contains three excerpts from the notes of William Clayton as he listened to Joseph Smith teach on three separate occasions on May 16th and 17th, 1843. These teachings weren't added to the Doctrine and Covenants until 1876, when 26 additional sections, several of which related to priesthood and temple, were added by Apostle Orson Pratt under the direction of President Brigham Young. Let's look at the backstory and analyze the text from each of these three occasions, one at a time. First, on May 16th, Joseph Smith and his scribe William Clayton briefly visited Carthage to attend to some business there and then proceeded to a church branch nearby in a town known as Ramus, which had recently been renamed Macedonia. According to William Clayton's journal, that evening, President Joseph and I went to Benjamin F. Johnson's to sleep. Benjamin was a dear and close friend of Joseph, whom he called Benny, and so whenever Joseph stayed in town, he stayed there at the home of Benjamin and Melissa Johnson. Clayton's journal continues, Before we retired, the president gave Brother Johnson and wife some instructions on the priesthood, which instruction, according to Clayton, was in part as follows. He said that except a man and his wife enter into an everlasting covenant and be married for eternity while in this probation by the power and authority of the holy priesthood, they will cease to increase when they die. That is, they will not have any children in the resurrection. But those who are married by the power and authority of the priesthood in this life and continue without committing the sin against the Holy Ghost, will continue to increase and have children in the celestial glory. Clarifying what it means to commit the sin against the Holy Ghost, Joseph explained, The unpardonable sin is to shed innocent blood or be accessory thereto. Then Clayton's journal continues, He also said that in the celestial glory there was three heavens or degrees, and in order to obtain the highest, a man must enter into this order of the priesthood, and if he don't, he can obtain it. He may enter into the other, but that is the end of his kingdom. He cannot have increase. It was this last statement in Clayton's journal that was later excerpted and slightly modified, likely by Elder Orson Pratt, and included as verses 1 to 4 in the 1876 version of this section in the Doctrine and Covenants. The modifications made to Clayton's notes are primarily grammatical, with one clarifying clause added in brackets in verse 2. So, with that said, let's analyze this text. Verse 1 here is commonly interpreted as saying that the highest degree of the three degrees of glory, the celestial kingdom, is itself subdivided into three additional heavens or degrees. But this is most likely a mistaken reading of the text, as it is based solely on the assumption that the phrase celestial glory is a reference to the celestial kingdom. However, in Joseph's day, as in our own, the word celestial was also a generic word meaning simply heavenly or the realms above. If William Clayton recorded his words accurately, it appears that Joseph is using the word celestial here in this more generic sense as a reference to heaven or the heavenly glory. Such a reading is consistent with Joseph's other teachings. For instance, Joseph had previously taught that the term heaven, as intended for the saint's eternal home, includes more kingdoms than one. And he discovered in his vision recorded in section 76 that there are, in fact, to be specific, three heavenly kingdoms within what he termed the eternal world or the world of glory, namely the telestial, terrestrial, and celestial. Elsewhere, Joseph explicitly spoke of these three kingdoms as being three heavens, the same phrase being used here in verse 1. So, rather than introducing a new doctrine in verse 1 about the highest of the three kingdoms being subdivided into three additional heavens or degrees, Joseph is almost certainly just reaffirming to Benjamin and Melissa Johnson what he had already revealed in section 76, that in the celestial, or heavenly glory, there are three heavens or degrees. And in verse 2, he is explaining what would be further clarified in section 132, that in order to obtain the highest of these three divisions of heavenly glory, a man must enter into this order of the priesthood, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. And if he does not, he cannot obtain the highest heaven. He may enter into the other, but that is the end of his kingdom. He cannot have an increase. Meaning, according to Joseph's teachings just prior to this paragraph in Clayton's journal, to have children in the resurrection. In this reading, then, the prophet Joseph is teaching that marriage in the everlasting covenant is required to attain the highest of the three heavens within God's eternal world of glory. As an interesting follow-up to this episode in the Johnson home, Five months later, on October 20th, Joseph again visited Benjamin and Melissa Johnson at their home, but this time he actually sealed them together as husband and wife. Benjamin recalled, In the evening Joseph called me and my wife to come and sit down, for he wished to marry us according to the law of the Lord. I thought it a joke, 
and said I should not marry my wife again unless she courted me, for I did it all the first time. He chided my levity, told me he was in earnest, and so it proved, for we stood up and were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, as for the backstory to the second episode, from which verses 5 and 6 originate, William Clayton recorded in his journal that on May 17th, after breakfast, we took a pleasure ride through Fountain Green, a town near Macedonia, then back at Macedonia. At 10 a.m., President Joseph preached on 2 Peter chapter 1. Joseph had focused on 2 Peter 1 in a sermon only three days earlier and would again focus on this same text in another sermon four days later. There was clearly something in this New Testament chapter that the prophet wanted his people to understand. But what was it? In a word, knowledge. And in another word, salvation. In 2 Peter 1, the Apostle Peter speaks of a certain kind of knowledge, what he calls the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And he testifies that as we steadily develop the divine attributes within ourselves, we will not be unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of Joseph's sermon on this day, William Clayton recorded that he showed that knowledge is power, and the man who has the most knowledge has the greatest power. Also, that salvation means a man's being placed beyond the powers of all his enemies. In that same chapter, the Apostle Peter also speaks of degrees of knowledge of God and Christ, which advance until a personal assurance is given that one's salvation has been made sure and certain. This is the category of knowledge Joseph was speaking of. Peter explained that it's one level of knowledge to know that Jesus is truly God's beloved Son. This is the foundation of a strong testimony. But, he says, there's a higher, surer form of knowledge still, what Peter cryptically calls a more sure word of prophecy. But what does that mean? According to Clayton's journal, Joseph explained this cryptic phrase. He said the more sure word of prophecy meant a man's knowing that he was sealed up unto eternal life by revelation and the spirit of prophecy through the power of the holy priesthood. Clayton continues, He also showed that it was impossible for a man to be saved in ignorance. Later, it was this portion of Clayton's notes from this sermon that were excerpted and included in 1876 here as verses 5 and 6. And so, in context, these two verses underscore the strong relationship between one's knowledge of and through God and Jesus Christ and one's salvation. Now, as for the backstory to verses 7 and 8, the last two verses of section 131, we need to know that Samuel Pryor, a Methodist preacher who had come to investigate the saints and Joseph Smith, had been in attendance at the prophet's sermon on 2 Peter 1 and had been quite impressed with what he heard. Samuel had then been invited, most likely by the prophet Joseph, to preach there in Macedonia that very evening to a congregation of Latter-day Saints. Samuel's own account says, In the evening I was invited to preach, and did so. The congregation was large and respectable, and they paid the utmost attention. This surprised me a little, he said, as I did not expect to find any such thing as a religious toleration among them. Although the content of this sermon wasn't recorded, it is clear from William Clayton's notes that Samuel had, for whatever length of time, preached on Genesis 2-7, which speaks of that moment of creation when the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. This verse had prompted much discussion among Christian commentators of that era who noted the dualistic distinction here between man's body and his spirit and who speculated as to their makeup and duration. A theological dictionary from that time, for instance, stated that the generally received opinion among Christians was that the human soul began to exist in his mother's womb and that it consisted of the vital, immaterial, active substance or principle in man. Compared to those who held such a view, Joseph Smith's understanding of the nature of man's spirit differed dramatically. In fact, just a year prior, Joseph had published an editorial directly opposing this traditional idea that the spirit of man is immaterial, arguing that the body is supposed to be organized matter, and the spirit by many is thought to be immaterial without substance. With this latter statement, we should beg leave to differ and state that spirit is a substance, that it is material, but that it is more pure, elastic, and refined matter than the body. Apparently, during Samuel Pryor's sermon that evening in Macedonia in front of Latter-day Saints, he had made some sort of commentary on Genesis 2-7, which reflected the more common Christian thinking of his day. And in so doing, he triggered a corrective response from the prophet. Samuel's own account of what occurred next says, After I had closed, 
Elder Joseph Smith, who had attended, arose and begged leave to differ from me in some few points of doctrine, and this he did mildly, politely, and affectingly, like one who was more desirous to disseminate truth and expose error than to love the malicious triumph of debate over me. I was truly edified with his remarks and felt less prejudiced against the Mormons than ever. William Clayton's journal captured the details of the prophet's corrective. In the evening, we went to hear a Methodist preacher lecture, Clayton began. After he got through, President Joseph offered some corrections as follows. Speaking of eternal duration of matter, he said, There is no such thing as immaterial matter. All spirit is matter, but is more fine or pure, and can only be discerned by purer eyes. We can't see it, but when our bodies are purified, we shall see that it is all matter. The gentleman seemed pleased, Clayton remarked, and said he should visit Nauvoo immediately. So later, as we can see, these excerpts from Clayton's account of the prophet's gentle correction to this humble Methodist minister's sermon were also included here in section 131. In summary then, Doctrine and Covenants 131 consists of three excerpts from the journal of William Clayton of the remarks of Joseph Smith on three separate occasions over the course of two days. The first was on Joseph's insightful teachings to the Johnsons in their home about how marriage is required to attain the highest level of heaven. The second was on Joseph's explanation during a sermon of the Apostle Peter's cryptic phrase about the more sure word of prophecy, underscoring the strong relationship between salvation and knowledge of and from the Lord. And the third was on Joseph's correction to the sermon of a Methodist minister, emphasizing the eternal and very material nature of the spirit of man. And that's the story of Doctrine and Covenants 131. 